Let's pray together as we start. He will give strength to his king. Father, we thank you so much for that promise that you will strengthen, that you will exalt your king and give him the place of honour. And so we ask this morning, as we listen in now to your word, we, we ask that you would help us to line ourselves up with that promise, to align ourselves with your values and your way of doing things, that you would keep us looking to your king and enable us to follow in his footsteps. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're back in the book of 1 Samuel, the book we've been in now on and off for two or three months, a book that is all about the search for a leader. And I hope that as we've gone along, it's become increasingly obvious that this storyline, this narrative of a search for a leader is not one that is limited to the events of this book from 3000 years ago, that this story of a search for a leader is one that taps into a narrative that is at the heart of every single human being that taps into a need that is at the heart of every single human being, our need for a leader. That every single one of us in different ways is looking for someone who will, who will be there for us, who will provide for us, who will fight our battles for us, who will, who will overcome on our behalf. And as 1 Samuel's gone on, we've become increasingly persuaded, I hope, that God is the one who will do that. From the very beginning, there was that story, wasn't there, of God and the Ark of the Covenant in Dagon's temple. We saw God can fight his battles. God doesn't need anyone else. If we will trust in him, he will be the one who is there for us. He will fight our battles. But as 1 Samuel's gone on, increasingly God has pointed towards a person he said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise someone up who will be the one who will fight for you, who will overcome on your behalf if you'll trust in him. And now, as far as where we've got to is concerned, it's obvious that that person is David. David is God's anointed one. He is his king, a man who is so perfectly aligned with what God is all about whose heart is so in keeping with who God is that, that God says, in effect, if you will trust in this one, in this king, then it is to trust in me. God's king and God are perfectly lined up with one another. David is the leader God's people need. We've seen David and, of course, we've seen increasingly Saul, a kind of a sort of anti-king, if you like. He represents everything that David is not. And now for the rest of the book of 1 Samuel, we're going to see their stories intertwined with each other across the course of the remaining chapters. It's as though the camera just simply goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between David and Saul as their stories play out. And the last time we saw them a couple of weeks ago, Saul was on the throne. He was in the place of power, surrounded by the good and the great of society. And David was in the lowly place, on the run desperately just trying to stay alive, spending his nights sleeping in caves in the wilderness. But we're not worried about that reality, because as the readers, we remember Hannah's prayer, a prayer that ended with those words, he will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. A prayer that was all about the God who lifts up the lowly and who brings low the proud. And so now we know it's just a matter of time, isn't it? It's just a matter of time before David is exalted to the highest place and Saul is brought low in his pride. The question is, how is that going to happen? What is God's way of doing this going to be? And we know if David surrounded himself with worldly counsellors, we know the approach he would take or at least be advised upon. David, they would say, you've got to assassinate Saul's character. Set yourself up with a social media account because there is no better way of getting people to unthinkingly drink in a distorted and corrupted view of the world than through social media. Set yourself up with a, an Instagram account for the 20-somethings, a Twitter account for the 30-somethings, a Facebook account for the over 41s, and that'll do the job nicely. From there, you can send out your barbs. You can distort Saul's character. You can bring him down and assassinate him character-wise. Or well, maybe people would say to him, actually, it's not a character assassination you need. It's a physical assassination. You just got to take Saul out of the equation. It's as simple as that. 
David, we know, can handle himself in a fight and he's increasingly surrounded by people who can help him. Maybe the moment is going to come for David to launch an all out assault on Saul to kill him and just take him out of the picture, because then the path to the throne is clear and David can go to the throne that is rightfully his. How is it going to play out? How is God going to exalt his king and bring low Saul? Well, let's read chapter 24 to begin to find out. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took three thousand chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way, for there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave, and the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterwards, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord the King! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks you harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put, put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord, Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the prover proverbs of the ancients say, out of the wicked comes wickedness but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Now, don't put your Bibles down, because we haven't really, uh, finished reading, not for the moment. Uh, we're going to read on, but we're going to skip a chapter. We're going to go from chapter 24 to chapter 26 and we're going to read chapter 26 in its entirety which as you begin to read will give you a sense of deja vu in fact it might even be that as you read you think um, hang on are we reading the same chapter again have they kind of got the the, uh, the video editing mixed up 
because chapter 26 has lots in common, loads in common with chapter 24. So as we read, I want you to pay careful attention, maybe even note down some of the similarities that there are between those two chapters. Crossway Kids, if you look at your meeting sheets, you've got a few little pointers to help you. You can fill in the gaps as you go along to see what the similarities are. And as you see the similarities, maybe then ask the question, what's the difference between these two chapters? Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill at Hashanah, which is on the east of Jeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with three thousand chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hashanah, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. And David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Then David said to ah Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Joab's brother Abishai, the son of Zeruai, who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day, now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the on, on, on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die, because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the jar of water that was at his head. Saul recognised David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my, my lord the king. And he said, Why does my lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth, away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like, like one who, hunt, who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more, no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the spear, O king. 
let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. So here's the question we're asking. How is it that David is going to get from his lowly position to the throne? And how is it that proud Saul is going to be brought low? Well, the answer that 1 Samuel chapters 24 to 26 seems to be giving is that it is not by David grabbing power for himself. In fact, it seems to be saying that it's going to be almost through the exact opposite process. You see, I wonder how you got on with the, the compare and contrast between chapters 24 and 26. Did you get that sense of deja vu as you were reading chapter 26? Did you notice the many points of comparison that there were between the two chapters? Did you see how Saul chooses an army of 3,000 men in both chapters to chase David into the hills? Did you notice how in both stories David is given an, it almost seems like a God-given opportunity to kill Saul? Do you know how in both stories David's men urge him to take the opportunity using almost the exact same language? Did you notice how in both stories David doesn't take the opportunity to kill Saul but instead confronts him giving almost identical reasons for why he hasn't killed Saul? Did you notice how in both stories David compares himself to a flea? And did you notice how in both stories it ends with Saul putting his hands up and admitting his guilt and David's innocence in the story? So many points of comparison. So many points of comparison that in the end you end up thinking to yourself, why is it that the author of 1 Samuel has included both of these stories? No doubt there were loads of stories from this period of, David, of David's life that he could have included, but for some reason he doesn't include all of them, but does include these almost identical seeming stories. Why include both? Well, the answer I think is because the points of comparison bring into even sharper relief the point of contrast between the two stories. Because I think between these two stories, there's one significant point of difference, a point of development, if you like, between the two stories. And it is in David's attitude and actions. You see, in the first story in chapter 24, there is a moment, just a fleeting moment, where we get a little window into David's soul and we see that there is something in there that wants, even if it's only brief, to grab power for himself. It's in the moment when in verse 4, he reaches out with his sword and, as we're told, stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. It's a moment full of symbolism in 1 Samuel. It seems like nothing to us, but it speaks of David reaching out to grab the kingdom for himself. And if we're wondering how we should feel about that, I guess we've only got to look at David's own reaction in verse 5. You see how David feels about what he's done? Verse 5, we're told afterwards, David heart, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. In the first story, it's as though David wants to grab power for himself. But in the second story, David is presented as the perfect protector of Saul. He has this opportunity to, uh, in the same way that Saul has wanted to pin him to the wall with a spear, so David has the opportunity in chapter 26 to pin Saul to the floor with the same spear. But instead of taking the opportunity, he protects Saul from his soldier who wants to do that. And the conversation with Abner brings that point right to the fore, doesn't it? It makes the point that Abner has failed to protect Saul and that David has ended up being the perfect protector of Saul. The polar opposite to the attitude we see just briefly there in chapter 24. It's a brilliant piece of storytelling. 
because as the readers we feel this sense of conflict don't we in chapter 4 and in chapter 26 when the moment comes to kill Saul as the reader because we've seen what they, uh, Saul is like we've seen how divisive and destructive his reign is we've seen how unjust he's been towards David who's only ever done him right but who has pursued him like a like an animal into the hills we know what Saul is like we know what he deserves and so when David gets the opportunity we are there with his soldiers saying do it do it do it we're urging him on and even though there's a frustration in chapter 24 from the fact that David doesn't take that moment we're still thinking to ourselves well at least he, he made a statement at least he showed Saul who's in charge. At least he, he, he gave a little taste to, to the trajectory that they're both on. But then in chapter 26, when David does nothing, in fact, when David protects Saul, I guess we feel a sense of conflict, don't we? We think to ourselves there is undoubtedly something virtuous in David's unwillingness to take vengeance, in his, in his patience and in his goodness and in his kindness towards Saul. And yet at the same time we're thinking to ourselves, how is he going to get to power if he misses out on opportunities like this? What, we're left asking the question, what kind of leader lets moments like this go begging on his way to the throne? And the answer that 1 Samuel, I think, is screaming at us is it's a leader who is after God's heart. It is a king who does not take vengeance himself and who does not exalt himself. This is a king who, who when the opportunity comes to exalt himself, to grab power himself, when that opportunity comes, he remembers it is written... You shall worship the Lord God, and him alone shall you serve. And this is the kind of king who, when an opportunity comes along to, to take blood guilt upon himself in order to achieve power, proves himself to have been tempted in every way, yet without sin. To ascend to the throne of Israel, in the Bible's understanding, is to be nothing less than God's ruler on earth but this king as we see him laying out what he's truly to be like demonstrates that he is not one who considers equality with God a thing to be grasped but who instead takes on the form of a servant this is a king who says to God not my will be done but your will be done this is the king who entrusts himself to God who judges justly this is the king who says to God, into your hands I commit my spirit. You see, these are the earliest moments we're seeing here in 1 Samuel of kingship in Israel. This is, if you like, the, the blueprint for what the king of Israel is truly to be like. This is what the Christ is to be like. And in these early moments, we are seeing a portrait of patience and of dependence, of lowliness, and of trust in God alone. And it's compelling, isn't it? Yes, it's counterintuitive because our human side that has a very human view of leadership is saying you should grab the power when it comes. You should take matters into your own hands, exalt yourself, and take vengeance upon your enemies. And yet at the same time, we know as we see it that this patience, this unwillingness to take, uh, to take vengeance, this unwillingness to self-exalt speaks of a strength because it speaks of a dependence upon God, which is what we need most of all from our leader. Uh, there's a, a, a musical out at the moment called Hamilton. You might have heard of it. Uh, one of my we've seen it now on Disney Plus and uh, and on the stage as well. It is brilliant. If you haven't seen it yet, you've got to see it. And don't worry, I'm not going to spoil the ending for you. But there's a there's a one of my favourite songs in it is called One Last Time, and you've got Lin Manuel Manuel Miranda as Hamilton, and Christopher Walker playing uh, George Washington with this awesome quiet confidence and authority. 
And it's in the moment when Thomas Jefferson has announced his resignation, one of the great political rivals of, of Hamilton and of Washington. And Hamilton cannot believe it. He cannot believe in the first moment the, the insubordination, the insolence of Jefferson. And at the same time, he can't believe the opportunity that has come their way. And so he says to Washington, this is the moment we can take him down. I'll write something in the press that will assassinate his character. And Washington takes Hamilton completely by surprise and says, no, do you know what? This is the moment I'm going to step back. I don't want you to assassinate him. I want you to leave things as they are. I am going to step back and I'm going to relinquish my power. And Hamilton cannot believe what he's hearing. He says to, he says to Washington, people are going to say that you're weak. And Washington says, no, they will see that I am strong as I step back, as I do not grab more power for myself, as I do not take vengeance upon my enemies. And as you're watching this scene playing out, you realise Hamilton's way is the way of weakness and Washington's way is the way of strength, what true leadership looks like. And as you hear the song being sung and as you see the scene being played out, you realise there's just the just faintest echo of what the true leader we need looks like. In a sense, what the true Christ will be like when he comes. He will not be one who exalts himself. He will not be one who takes vengeance for himself. He will be the one who quietly, with true strength and authority, depends upon God because God's king trusts God to take vengeance and to exalt. Like I say, you see, these early chapters are a blueprint for us of what true leadership as we need it looks like. And more specifically, it's a blueprint of what the Christ will be like when he comes. 1 Samuel is saying for us, if you like, this is the leader you should be looking for. This is the blueprint you should be searching out. Look for a king. Keep your eyes out for a king who, when he comes, does not take vengeance upon his enemies at the earliest opportunity and who does not seek power at the earliest opportunity. Rather, look out for the king who quietly pursues righteousness when he has the opportunity, even to the point where he says of his enemies, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing and says, when you find that king, when you find that leader, throw your lot in with him and no one else. He's the leader you need who will fight your battles for you and conquer your ultimate enemies. It's true of David, but it's even truer of King Jesus. If you found him, you have found the leader after God's heart and you need look nowhere else. I suppose the question we're left asking uh, as we see this portrait, though, is how does this king find it in him to trust and to have this quiet strength expressed in patience that depends upon God? Well, that's where chapter 25 comes in. We've read chapters 24 and 26, but they function like the two pieces of bread in a sandwich. And in between is chapter 25, where we see David learn the lesson that enables him to have that quiet, patient dependence that we then see in chapter 26. So we're going to read now from chapter 25. We're not going to read the whole chapter because it's quite long, but it's the story of David and a man called Nabal. And Nabal's name literally means uh, fool. <laughs> I don't know what was going through his parents' head when they decided to give him that name, but that's what they call him, little baby fool, Nabal. Fool is the word that, that Saul uses to describe himself in, verse, in chapter 26. And in chapter 25, as you read through the details, you see lots of small details that are meant to make us think that Nabal is just like Saul. It's like David coming face to face with him again. David in chapter 25 is the perfect shepherd. He looks after Nabal's sheep for him and then goes to Nabal, or at least through a messenger, says to Nabal, look, we've looked after your sheep for you. We've done the right thing. Would you mind giving me and my men some food and some water and some general kind of care and respite? And Nabal, the fool, says to him, get out of town. I'm not interested in looking after you. And in that moment, kind of understandably, the red mist just descends upon David. He is tempted to take vengeance upon himself. He gathers his army and says, we're going to go and wipe out Nabal for this once and for all. And you're thinking, here is David with the opportunity to take vengeance again. 
What is the lesson that he's going to learn? And then Abigail comes onto the scene, one of the Bible's many portraits of wonderful women who see sense when the men are losing their heads. And Abigail, who is Nabal's wife, rides out to David to confront him. And we're going to pick up the moment in the dialogue where she begins to speak to David. Listen carefully to what she says. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my lord, be the guilt. Please let your service, your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not, my lord, regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left, to, left in Nabal so much as one nail, then David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice, and I have granted your, permission, your petition. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light. In the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal had, was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord, who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal, and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. So David encounters Nabal, uh, Nabal the fool, a man who feasts and acts like he is a king, but of whom 1 Samuel says he was harsh and worthless and badly behaved. And we see exactly that in David's experience. David comes to him, he says, I've, I've protected your sheep and your shepherds. I've only done good to you. Could you give me some food for my men to feast? And Nabal only acts in disdain towards David. He refers to him simply as this son of Jesse, echoing Saul's description of David. The parallels are many and various, and David again has an opportunity to reach out 
and to take vengeance upon his enemy. And that is exactly what he's about to do. He gathers his men, they ride out for war because they are going to teach Nabal a lesson he will never forget. But when the moment comes, David doesn't do it. David doesn't take vengeance. And the question is why? And the answer to that question is Abigail. Wonderful Abigail, who rides out to meet David. And as she meets David, we overheard the dialogue. She convinces him of two things. First of all, she convinces him that God is the one who will establish his kingdom so that David doesn't need to reach out and do it himself. You see that in verse 28. Just look down at your Bible in front of you. Verse 28 of chapter 25, just in the second sentence there, she says, The Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. The Lord's going to do it. You're fighting his battles. Don't worry. Let him establish you as king. And then she says, you don't need to worry, David, about taking vengeance upon your enemies, because again, the Lord is going to do that for you. Verse 29. If men rise up to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your gods. He'll take care of you. And then she goes on and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. God will take care of your enemies. You don't need to worry about that. You don't need to do the exalting. You don't need to do the avenging. God's got it covered. And 10 days later, that's exactly what happens. Verse 37, towards the end of the story. In the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone, and about 10 days later, listen to this, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. David steps back and pursues the path of peace and the Lord steps in and carries out righteous vengeance upon Nabal. And on this day, David learns a very valuable lesson that will be at the heart of his kingdom, at the heart of the kingdom of God. The lesson is this. He is convinced now that it is God who avenges and exalts his king. It's God who avenges and exalts his king. And it's this conviction now that David has that then drives and shapes his response that we saw earlier in chapter 26. When Abishai is saying to David, do it, do it, do it, reach out, take the spear, pin Saul to the floor. What does David say in chapter 26, verse 10? He says, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him or his day will come or he will go down into battle and perish. I don't need to reach out and grab power because I can trust the Lord that he will do it at the right time and in the right way. And it's this conviction that is at the heart of David's kingship and is at the heart of David's kingdom. And of course, wonderfully, when the blueprint is fulfilled, it's exactly what we see in the life of the true and better David, Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just at the heart of David's kingdom, it's at the heart of the kingdom of God, this principle. Jesus Christ, you remember, as he walks the earth, he's surrounded isn't he again and again by people who say to him look we, we want to make you king now we want to make you king by force we're sick of the romans ruling over us we want to get you to jerusalem so that you jesus christ can be established as the messiah on the throne ruling over israel and again and again jesus resists and says no it's not the time this is not the way He's surrounded even by disciples, his closest group, who, who say to him on occasion, look, Lord, is, is now the time for us to call down fire from heaven on your enemies? Or when the crunch moment comes, Simon Peter, remember, he pulls out his sword and he starts fighting as though Jesus' kingdom was of this earth. And again and again, Jesus says, no, not now and not in this way. He trusts God to do it his way. And so rather than fighting and railing and power grabbing as is the way of the world Jesus Christ instead waits and trusts and suffers and does it all to serve that's the nature of the kingdom of God and the God he serves loves it 
that the God he serves loves this servant heart at the heart of Jesus Christ, the lack of the power grab, as it were, and says of Jesus, this is my man. This is the king you need. This is the one through whom I'm going to sort out all of your problems. Philippians chapter 2 says of him that because Jesus Christ took the place of a servant, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God loved this about Jesus and as a consequence, what does he do? He exalts Jesus and puts him in the highest place to rule over all. And because our King, King Jesus, was convinced of this, that he could trust Jesus to exalt him at the right time, sorry, that he could trust God to exalt him at the right time and to avenge his enemies at the right time, well, we follow in his footsteps, living according to exactly the same set of principles. This trust in God to do the right thing at the right time is at the heart of the kingdom of God. And we need to be people who soak ourselves in it and live according to it, especially at this fractious and broken moment in our society. This is what we are to be like. You know that our society lives according to the opposite set of principles. We are a society that is all about exalting ourselves and all about taking vengeance upon our enemies. You've only got to spend five minutes on social media to see that that is exactly the case. I guess you see something of it in the maybe the offices that you uh, used to work in or the staff rooms that you're part of or the hospitals that you're part of. It's full of people exalting themselves and taking vengeance upon their enemies. We're not far away from election season in America now. You're going to see that played out, thank goodness, on the other side of the world from us. But nonetheless, we're going to see it played out week in, week out as the, the candidates exalt themselves and take vengeance upon their enemies. Tragically, so often it's the character, isn't it, of the the conversation about social justice and equality in our society. This is the moment when, when that group needs to rise up and take power. They need to get their share for a while. They need to be exalted. And that group, well, they need to be brought low. Vengeance needs to come upon them for whatever reason. It's the character of the way the world does power. Grab it and take vengeance on your enemies. And it's not that the Christians are disinterested in social justice or politics or any of these things. Far from it. We just don't do it the way the world does it because our king didn't do it the way the world does it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a name you might have heard. He is famous for speaking out against the Nazi regime in his day. He was a a pastor and theologian in Germany during the rise of the Nazis to power and during the Second World War. But he was clear and outspoken in his opposition to their uh, hateful, racist, unjust, genocidal rule. It cost him his life in the end as they martyred him. Listen to what he said as he understood the character of the king and the character of the kingdom of God that we inhabit today as Christians. He said this, the will of God to which the law gives expression is that people should defeat their enemies by loving them. By loving them. That's the character of the kingdom of God. And you can only say those words, you can only live out that reality as King David did, as King Jesus did, as we are called to do. You can only live out that reality if you are convinced that God is the God who will do the exalting at the right time and the avenging at the right time. And if you are convinced that in and through King Jesus Christ, he has established his kingdom in exactly that way. Let's pray for ourselves. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for King Jesus. We praise you that he was willing to trust you to patiently suffer and serve even his enemies, us, that he was willing to love us even to death rather than take vengeance upon us as we deserve. Father, you saw that and you exalted him to the highest place. And so we pray, Lord, that you would give us a deep and a lasting trust in him and that his kingdom would be the one we are most passionate passionate about seeing established. 
And we pray, Lord, that as you establish his kingdom more and more, you would enable us and strengthen us to be people who follow in his footsteps. Help us not in our private lives and our public lives to be people who exalt ourselves and who desire to take vengeance upon our enemies. Help us instead to be people who follow in the footsteps of Jesus, loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us, trusting that the time will come when you will bring justice once and for all. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.